general mental health. I think we're in the alumni theatre. I'm on Jenny Beecham and I'm going to share this session. You now have about 30 seconds to move out into another room if you think you might be in the wrong place. Um, so, and I have crib notes to tell me what to tell you about. Um, so, all our presentations are linked to mental health. And we've got our Ring Lloyd Edmonds, Isabel Harrison, and Jessica, Trisha Jessica, Trisha, Trisha Jessica, sorry. Um, and then, as Frank can't be here today, his colleague Stephen Joseph has promised to give us a couple of minutes just to outline very broadly what their study is about. And then we're going to open the discussion. We are going to keep the time because there's a very, very scary lady in a red t shirt with the signs keeping people at the time. Um, I'm hoping you've all got your mobile phones off. And we are aiming to <coughs> video the session, and hopefully that will be going up online. And what else have I got to tell you? Oh yes, of course your slides are in your handbook, you will have already seen that. Okay, so that's enough from me. Let me start straight away and introduce um, our first speaker. So we're starting off with Bryn Lloyd Evans, who is a lecturer in mental health and social care, UCL. And Bryn's going to talk to us about his study. Do you want me to find it for you? Okay. Once we've got through the technical, technological challenges. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Glad we've got some folk coming to our presentation here. Um, so I'm going to talk, thanks for the opportunity to talk about our ongoing study, the Community Navigators study, which is really about trying to develop and try out a project to try and reduce loneliness for people with depression and anxiety who are using secondary mental health services, so for people with quite severe and enduring depression or anxiety. Um, just to sort of be clear, we're all on the, the same page about understanding what we're talking about. So loneliness, first thing to say is just that it's a subjective concept, nobody else can kind of observe and tell you whether you're lonely, it's how you feel that is what it's about. Um, and although there's a lot of overlap with kind of the amount of social contact you have, they're not the same thing. So people with, who have got very little social contact are more vulnerable to loneliness, but you can be socially withdrawn and perfectly happy with that, or you can actually have a lot of sort of people around you and yet experience loneliness if you feel that you're not connecting with anyone or no one understands you. Um, and importantly as well, although it's also related to depression, it's not the same thing as that. So if you are feeling very depressed, you might be less sort of, um, you might experience less value from the relationships you have or underplay the sort of love and affection there is for you. But people can be depressed but not lonely or lonely but not depressed. And, and in terms of sort of mental health and the relationship to health outcomes, that's, that's quite important. Um, Social and emotional loneliness can be experienced, so the social one is more about actual sort of social contact and emotional, and it's the kind of feelings of disconnection or being separate from others. And importantly, in terms of research, you can measure this. So we uh, sort of love a measure in academic circles, and there are at least two really good ones. So the UCLA loneliness scale and the de jong gierveld scale both got good sort of psychometric properties and can assess sort of change in loneliness over time well. Um, and if you're interested in all these kind of concepts like perceived social support and social capital and loneliness and social isolation and how they relate and how they're different from each other, I just recommend this review that um, School for Social Care Research were kind enough to, to commission that my colleague at UCL, Jing Yi Wang, led on, which is open access and available now. Um, so our study is about developing this intervention, really, a sort of programme of support to try and help reduce loneliness for people who are experiencing it. And just here's the sort of pitch, really, for why it's important for people in, in sort of mental health services. So loneliness is fashionable, isn't it? We know an increasing amount that it's really kind of toxic and bad news for both your physical and mental health. And loneliness, if you're lonely, it predicts a whole range of sort of poor health outcomes. But I think most of the kind of um, research and the policy initiative and the kind of media stuff associates loneliness with older people, doesn't it? Those are the sort of big billboards you see. But it's actually a sort of huge issue for people with mental health difficulties of all ages. Um, so your kind of social network is likely to be a lot smaller if you have mental health problems compared to the general population, and your risk of being lonely and enduring loneliness is much higher. 
And for people with depression and anxiety in particular, the links are quite well established, that if you're lonely as well as depressed, then your chances of making a sort of swift and full recovery are less good. So it's, it's sort of bad news for your health outcomes too. Um, what do we know? We don't know that much really as well about what to do about it really. So there are a range of interventions and there was a good systematic review of about six years ago now. But that looked a lot at some sort of cognitive approaches for changing how you think about things and also perhaps sort of um, slightly old fashioned approaches now looking at social skills training and things like that. And perhaps the most common approach that's available in sort of standard care now, certainly in primary care, would be social prescribing type interventions where you have a link worker who tries to work out your interests and your needs and link you into stuff that's going on in your community that might actually be helpful both in terms of social con contact and well-being. But we know very little really about the effectiveness of social prescribing and what we do know is largely in a primary care setting. So how far that kind of approach is helpful or applicable to people with more severe and enduring problems in secondary care we, we know very little about. And crucially, I think, this is something that really isn't done as much as one would hope in secondary mental health services. So there was a very good study, I'm sorry, I've glossed over a lot of the references just for time, but there was a very good study by Vanessa Pinfold and colleagues um, looking at sort of um, health and, and social networks, and they, they developed this kind of wellbeing network mapping, which I'll come on to. But they interviewed a lot of mental health staff, really, and they said, well, what do you think about social isolation and loneliness, and is that an issue for people? And, and generally the reply was, Yes, it certainly is, but it's kind of, it's either it's not my job to help with that or I don't have that time to help with that. And I think one of the things about loneliness is that it's never urgent, is that if somebody's health is deteriorating or somebody's tenancy in their housing is in jeopardy or whatever, those things are sort of get to the top of the list because they're urgent concerns, whereas sort of chronic loneliness and being isolated can be important but never make it to the top of the list. And that was really our sort of pitch for why we might be helpful to have a separate person, a navigator, whose job is only to help with that, really, so it never gets swamped with other concerns, that, that you provide this in addition to standard care and have some specific help with, with kind of isolation and loneliness. So this is what we're planning to do. It's a two-year study, which we're about a year into now, um, funded by the School for Social Care Research here, and the research team comes from UCL and our partners, the Pin Foundation. And really what we're trying to do is develop and test this um, program of support from a community navigator to reduce loneliness. And we're basing it in two NHS trusts, so Barnet, Enfield and Haringey and Camden and Islington, and the sort of secondary care teams for depression and anxiety in both of those trusts. Uh, this is just some of the people involved. It's more than that. And one of the things at the bottom there, we've got our kind of working group where we've got a range of people with a range of expertise, both lived experience, experience from practice and research, who have been integral to sort of developing the programme we're, we're making. Um, and basically this study comes into three bits. So we had about six months at the beginning to think what exactly was it we we're trying to do and to try and sort of specify exactly what we wanted our navigators to be doing and how they supported people. Then we had another six months to give it a go and try it out with 10 service users and get as much feedback as we could from the people receiving the support and the navigators about what worked well and refine the programme. And the bit we're just about to start now is year two, which is a sort of mini trial, um, a mini randomised trial, to give that a go really, to see whether we can run a trial of this sort of intervention and to try it out with a larger group of people and again get more evaluation both quantitative and, and qualitative at the end about how that's worked. So it's a feasibility study. What we're not going to get to at the end is a kind of definitive answer to how effective is this for reducing loneliness or improving health outcomes. But I think we've got a good process to sort of establish, can this be done, might it be helpful, and to lead on to a bigger study to follow. And what we've tried to do, I suppose, is to sort of follow um, good practice guidelines for developing a complex intervention rather than just launching in. We've kind of had some time to think about what we're doing and to manualise it and to sort of show really how what our navigators are going to do might lead to the, the outcomes we hope for and to give it a good set of two lots of testing at this point um, to really sort of iron out how it can work best and what the difficulties might be. And then a future stage will be a sort of bigger study to really test, test effectiveness. So developing the intervention, well we did that in a sort of as far as possible a co-produced way so we had eight meetings with our, our stakeholder group with these sort of three types of expertise represented um, and that those meetings were informed also by quite a lot of consultation with people doing this kind of work sort of linking or navigational social prescribing work 
And in particular, we had a, a link and some consultancy from Wellbeing Enterprises, who are an organisation up in Runcorn, who have been delivering social prescribing for over a decade up there. Um, Groups for Health, which is an Australian organisation that provides a sort of group programme looking at social identities and trying to reduce loneliness and the National Development Team for Inclusion. And we've also consulted some more London services like Certitude and Bromley by Bow, social prescribing service. Um, we've done some literature reviews, both on interventions to reduce loneliness and the links with health outcomes. And what we've tried to develop from that is a kind of manual for, to help our navigators to guide them on what they should be doing and a theory of change about how we think this programme might be helpful for people. Okay, so I'm just going to talk you very briefly now through what the programme is, and then I'll talk about where we've got to in the study. So, structure, here's what we've come up with, really. So people are going to have up to ten sessions of one-to-one -one support from a navigator. That's more, typically, than people get in a social prescribing service in primary care. But we thought this might be sort of suitable, really, for the nature of the client group we're working with and needing some time to sort of um, develop a rapport and, and, and engage people, and then also to sort of see plans through and thinking that there might be some sort of false starts with trying to, to make new social contact and needing to sort of revise plans. Um, but it is a time-limited programme, so over six months, and we've given our navigators access to a budget, so up to about 100 quid per participant. And the thing about that, I think, is that it's immediately available. So if they work out with something, somebody that, something that would be really good to do, like there's a kind of community singing group that starts next week and it costs five quid, they've got the money to sort of help access that right away, so people won't be... Um, excluded from things for financial reasons and there won't be these terrible time delays when you apply for a personal budget or whatever and then the group stop by the time you get it through. Um, we planned an additional group element, it seemed, although it's primarily a one-to-one -one sort of programme, it seemed a missed opportunity not to give those people taking part some opportunity to meet each other and there might be sort of opportunities for people to do stuff together as well. And crucially, we really want it to be additional to standard care. So this isn't a way of getting people out the door of secondary services or for the care coordinator to cut down the support they provide. So it's trying to be meeting this unmet need. Um, um, and the navigators are uh, sort of based in secondary care and su supervised by social workers within the team. So here are some of the key components. Um, so two really crucial things are this kind of mapping people's social worlds and then developing a connections plan. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. We're also building in some of the stuff about social identities from the Groups for Health programme. And we really want it to be solution focused, so we're not trying to sort of um, deal with sort of long standing problems or barriers, but to do what's possible and to focus on what people can do. So it's a <coughs> strength approach. And, and we've tried to drum it into the navigators that other difficulties people might have, like housing or health or whatever, are to be diverted back to the care coordinator. So you just focus on, on social contact. Uh, this is a network map. Basically, the idea is that before you plan things with people, you get to know them a bit, you get to know who people know, what are the assets in their life, what do they like doing, where do they already go, what's an interest with it, which isn't met at the moment. And here's a connections plan, which is basically just to try and make some sort of feasible goals with people about what they'd like to do. So if somebody's identified singing as an interest, keep coming up back to singing, football, whatever it might be, then you have some sort of plan for how people are going to connect with people in that if people have got some old friends they've lost touch with, what's the first thing they're going to do to try and recreate those contacts? And we've put it all together with quite a lot more information in a manual which will be publicly available by the end of the study. Uh, and I struggle a bit with theories of change. I think certainly at this point they're always theoretical and how you hope a project program might work is not necessarily the same as how it does and it will almost certainly be multifaceted in a complex thing like this. But one thing, helpful framework, I think, was this de young Gearville framework that there are three ways of trying to reduce loneliness. You either help people meet new people, and we've got some ways of trying to do that, or enhance what support people get from their existing relationships, and we've got some ways of trying to do that, or trying to change thinking as well. So we're hoping that our navigators can attempt to do all three of those things. We'll monitor how, how the intervention's going at both stages, um, so we'll get some basic data on how, how sessions are organised, what navigators do in the sessions, um, but also kind of using both our outcome measures and especially our qualitative work, I think, to understand how it's working, what people value from it, uh, what changes and what doesn't in terms of um, sort of people's experience of it. Um, preliminary testing we've now completed. I realise I'm sort of, how am I doing for time now? Yeah, okay. Um, so we've tried it out with 10 participants, um, five from each of our two trusts. We've managed to get the sort of management structures and organisation in the NHS in place. 
and eight participants completed the program. Uh, the two who didn't, one sadly died and one went back into hospital, but the eight people who continued to live in the community all stuck with it, which gave us some sort of confidence about its acceptability. The group program we tried out was a lot less well received and we tried to learn from that for the next phase. And we tried a fairly structured Groups for Health type program which wasn't what people wanted, they told us really. And we've now completed qualitative interviews with, with six of the eight people who took part and the three navigators. And overall, people have been really positive. So I think we've managed to recruit well. We've got three lovely people who are positive and friendly without being pushy. Um, people really value that they just focused on social connections and they said even when I, you know, I have other difficulties but it was great to spend some time just on this. Even though people find it challenging and scary, they, they valued that support. Um, and some people made big changes actually in, in their amount of activity and social contact, but even where people didn't, the small gains and the sort of increased hopefulness, I think, were, were valued. People found endings difficult, any nice relationship is hard to end. Our group programme was difficult and we're going for a much smaller and less structured sort of group element in the next phase. And communications with other secondary mental health and getting hold of sort of care plans and crisis plans and things were, were sort of predictable organisational challenges. Um, just a few quotes there. Um, I think a couple of the things we really liked there. The asset mapping seemed to be good. Our navigators become experts in their local communities really and able to sort of help people link into things that might be helpful. And we really wanted this to be different from a befriending um, sort of intervention. So it's trying to help people do stuff themselves and find stuff that's sustainable rather than the relationship be the key. So the next phase, we're trying it out with a feasibility trial where 30 people will get this support and there'll be 10 controls. And I think the purpose of doing a trial is basically just to see if we can and to give that a go, but it's also with an eye on the next stage, that if we can demonstrate this is doable in a trial, then our chances of getting funding for a big study are, are greater. Uh, the main outcomes won't be sort of like, did we reduce loneliness or did we improve health, because we haven't really got the numbers. So it's really, could we recruit people? Could we retain them in the study? Could the navigators deliver the intervention as planned? So did people actually get their kind of network map and their goals and all the rest of it? And what do people think of it? What do they tell us, especially in quality stuff? Was it uh, acceptable? We will have a manual, we'll have a theory of change model at the end, we'll have some procedures that we can sort of use to people in a training programme for the navigators, and some preliminary evidence about is this a helpful thing. If we can make it work, if all that goes well, the next stage will be a big study that might make people like nice to take notice, um, if we kind of um, can demonstrate that it's also effective in helping with outcomes. I'm lurking over you. And most importantly, Thank you very much. we'll learn something about how to reduce loneliness for people with depression and anxiety. Thank you. Where do we find them? Yeah, from how, how do you get yeah. people to participate in, in, yeah. in so the we, session? We're asking people who are already in secondary mental health services, so they're in a team for depression and anxiety, and we approach people through staff, really. So um, we do try you ask them if they want to get involved in Yeah, do you want to? So there are ways, we, we do talk about loneliness. It's not a, I know there are schools of thought about is that a sort of off-putting and stigmatising <coughs> word, but we would generally talk about do you want to increase social connections and enhance or develop more relationships with other people and um, well, the kind of ways of it's pitched. So I'm sorry, I just don't understand how the navigator works then. I mean, if you ask people who are already in the system whether they want to get involved in, how does the navigator, I don't understand. Okay. So if somebody says yes, they'd like that help, then um, the navigator would then be put in touch with them by their existing staff and would meet and would explain who they were and what they're doing and sort of that just reiterate that they're just there to try and help with social connections and increasing sort of social contact um, and then would do these sort of bits really and it's it's kind of meant to be sort of additional to and fairly sort of distinct from the other support that people are getting and typically in these services people get a lot of medical reviews they actually get quite a bit of psychology in this but they don't get a ton of help of this sort with some social activity. Um, first of all, thank you for the very brilliant and fundamental presentation. Um, having supported someone with depression and anxiety, 
um, one of the fundamental problems is they don't want to engage. Uh, and, and they may not even recognize that they are feeling lonely or, or uh, accept that they are lonely. How do you deal with that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, it's one of the things we'll learn. Uh, I think in the first stage, it was not too hard at the big services to find 10 people who take part. But I think we want to look carefully at, to get 40 people, how many people do we have to ask? You know, is this something that lots of people are happy to take up? But I've actually been really pleasantly surprised because I had those fears as well, actually. Is this just sort of too frightening or somebody who's seriously depressed? It's not, not where they're at. But, but I think people perceive this as something that they want help with. and it's. It, so far, it's not looking too difficult to get it. But I think the care coordinator's role is quite helpful as well. There's somebody who actually knows the person, has a relationship, can do a bit of kind of presenting it in a way about give this a go, it could be helpful, and <coughs> helping people have the courage to sort of make contact and say, yeah. Two more questions. One up in the back row, and then the lady down here in the front. I, I would guess with our work, we really have support and um, sort of feeling the strategy on the community settings, so it really does catch up with you. <coughs> clinicians letting go is the is the barrier about all these people they're not trained to navigate because I just wondered what kind of training your sort of big workers navigators went through and how you potentially manage that. Yeah. So we've um we've developed a sort of training programme that's sort of five days really plus a kind of trust induction um, I think one of the things that's helped is that the, the supervisors of the teams from both trusts have come and been part of that training programme. So they kind of both, I think it reassures them that they've got their bits on sort of dealing with risks and the structures and those kind of things in. But also they get to meet these people, which I think, and, and through supervision, it builds up some confidence. Um, I think it helps in some ways that they're kind of trust employees. That creates its own difficulties as the risks of sort of losing your separate role and getting sucked into a existing system but I think it increases confidence that people are working within a structure and I think it's great that you know that both these trusts have 24-7 open access crisis services so there's even if they're meeting someone to go out and do something in the evening you, you know there's kind of help at hand that people are not going to be left on their own to manage a potentially difficult situation. Can I take just one more question for the We should have some time after everybody's finished presenting so if you've got a further question just don't forget it, write it down somewhere and we'll pick it up later. Any quickly, just, both of you, please. Just interested in the age range of your participants, because I know you said there's yeah. been a big focus on older people. Are you excluding older people from this or no. is it all ages? Yeah, no, they're ageless services, but um, so we, we would see people over 65, but most people are between 18 to 65. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, next we've got Isabel Harrison. Um, Isabel is from the University of London. And she's going to talk to us about her study on social inclusion. Not needed. Nobody needs wonderful. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Um, I'm Isabel Harrison. I work at St George's University of London and also University College London. And I work on a study of social inclusion, and I'm reporting on a study which we haven't analysed our results yet, it's due to finish this autumn. But I'm going to tell you about um, the work of my research group on developing a measure to look at social inclusion in mental health. This is one of those times when I wish I could get on with very focal, so please excuse the glasses on and off. Okay, so firstly, what is social inclusion? Um, the the area has been marred to some extent by differing concepts and definitions, first described by Durkheim in um, understanding the relationship between society, cohesion and health. And the word social inclusion and exclusion became sort of more commonly used in the UK and Europe when the EU came into being and there was a need for a kind of unitary policy on it. However, Presently, still, so the words social inclusion and social integration um, are used interchangeably in both policy and research. And social integration, the latter, is more of a US term. Um, in a, a review of measures from 2014, there was a very nice quote from a participant in a study looking at policy and social inclusion who said that 
um, a, a quite an elegant thing. Social inclusion must come down to somewhere to live, something to do, someone to love. It's as simple and as complicated as that. <coughs> so for the purposes of our study, we defined it as the ability of an individual to participate fully in the community that they would like to participate in and activities such as social leisure, entertainment and education work and civic duties and the converse of that, the lack of inclusion or social exclusion occurring when an individual doesn't participate in the activities in where they live for reasons beyond their control and crucially in which they would like to participate. Okay, why is it important in mental health? Well, people with mental health problems can experience um, social exclusion due to a combination of internal and external factors. The internal factors can be secondary to the symptoms of the illness themselves and may include a lack of confidence and low self-esteem. A stigma can directly exclude people from participation in jobs, education. Um, Self-stigma, self also described as anticipated discrimination, can occur when people have experienced discrimination and they can internalise that and that can exclude them themselves, a sort of self-motivating thing where they're unable to take part because of their fear of experiencing discrimination. In terms of um, the illness course, exclusion can exacerbate the symptoms of the illness and delay recovery. I think it's evident as well that exclusion can be both a cause and consequence of mental health problems. In terms of poli policy, there's a recognition, the acknowledgement of the importance of social inclusion has led to it becoming a key aim in government health and social care services. And an improvement in the ability of health and social care professionals to um, assess and monitor social inclusion is required to develop more appropriate interventions. The Royal College of Psychiatrists have stated that improving social inclusion can be as important an outcome as symptom reduction. So why do we need to assess social inclusion in mental health? There's currently a lack of evidence about um, demographic clinical characteristics. So, for instance, whether there's any differential effect of someone's age, their gender or ethnicity on their experience of inclusion. And how um, the impact of different illnesses, so, for instance, how psychotic disorders compare with common mental disorders in the experiences of social inclusion. Um, there's a need for interventions informed by empirical data and interventions determined by the needs of service users, so rather than a top-down approach, um, as being aligned to the recovery-based approach that's um, current now in mental health. So there's currently no um, valid or accepted measure of social inclusion in mental health settings. So I'm going to tell you about the measure we've developed, which is the social inclusion questionnaire user experience, understandably shortened to sync. We've developed it to address this deficit. Um, it's a structured interview rather than self-report. And um, it was developed um, based on the findings from the Poverty and Social Exclusion Survey by Gordon and colleagues in 2000, which assessed the extent and consequences of poverty deprivation and exclusion in the British general population. So it assesses participation in society and it importantly assesses whether that participation is desired or not. So it includes a subjective aspect rather than a predetermined idea of what exclusion and inclusion is. Um, the, the purpose of the measure is that it'll provide a structured approach for all disciplines working in mental health to consider, measure and address <coughs> social inclusion. We predict that it could be used in care planning to track change in social inclusion, to identify and evaluate the impact of any interventions and to inform discussion about social inclusion between a practitioner and a service user. The study was piloted and there were two papers uh, published from the pilot. This one by Meze, who is the PI of the study and colleagues, published in 2012, was on 66 individuals with a psychotic illness and the findings were that social inclusion decreased following the <coughs> diagnosis of psychotic disorder and a greater decline in inclusion over time was associated with a longer duration of illness 
and older <coughs> age. As far as the psychometric properties of the measure itself, it was found to have con good convergent validity with a social integration domain scores found to be positively associated with quality of life. And concurrent validity was established with all the domains of the measure, um, demonstrating moderate but significant associations with the six, which is a measure of social outcome stroke inclusion in mental health care developed by Preeb and colleagues. So the current study I'm working on is to establish the psychometric properties of the SYNC as a measure of social inclusion with a range of severe <coughs> mental health problems to improve social care practice in adult mental health settings. So we're looking at further testing the validity and establishing the reliability of the measure. We want to describe and compare experiences across a range of severe mental health problems with a larger sample of 200 participants. And we are looking at factors associated with social inclusion. And we, one of the outcomes of the study is to develop and pilot training for professionals in the use of the application and application of the measure. We're funded by the NIHR for two years. <coughs> okay, we recruit from two trusts, Camden and Islington, the north of London, and South West London, Georgia's in the south. Quite diverse. Camden Islington is quite dense, but um, the South Trust is more kind of diverse socioeconomically. Um, the methodology is that we see people under the care of adult mental health teams, so they're 18 <coughs> years and over. They need to have had at least one inpatient admission in their history and have a primary diagnosis of psychosis, common mental disorder, or personality disorder. We see them longer than three months since discharge if they've had an admission in the recent in their recent history so we're not getting a kind of a biased uh, level of service contact and inclusion and exclusion in their community and they need to be receiving care in the community from secondary mental health services and to be able to speak and understand english because the um, questionnaires we use are apparently not standardized to people who are unable to speak any english at all different languages so our main study sample, we see 80 people in the psychotic disorder category, and they can include people with schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, and bipolar disorder. The second main group, those with common mental disorder, people with depression, anxiety, and OCD. A smaller sample are those with personality disorder. We're also interested in whether there's anything to do with um, family, cultural, or socioeconomic factors that may affect social inclusion that is unrelated to mental illness. So we ask the service users who we interview if they have unaffected siblings that we can interview and do the sync with so to allow us to explore that question. Our service users are interviewed <coughs> and they're given, we get them socio-demographic data, clinical and risk history. We use quality of life, the social outcomes measure, discrimination stigma, loneliness scale that Bryn mentioned, and symptoms, needs, also the measure itself. So the measure covers five domains, productivity, social integration, access to services, political involvement, and consumption. And participation in the domains is recorded in the year prior to the person's first psychiatric hospital admission, thank you, and currently, so the previous 12 months. Scores for the five domains can be calculated with a higher score, donating a greater level of social inclusion. These, some, these are examples of some of the items fitting within the different domains. So productivity, whether they're in paid employment, whether they're doing any voluntary or sheltered work. And all the items require yes or no answers or very simple sort of one to three. Um, there are 75 questions in it, but it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to administer and it's quite... Um, appears to be quite well tolerated. Um, social integration, do you belong to any clubs or societies and how many people outside those who are in your care team can you confide in? Access to services, whether they're registered with a GP, if they've ever been turned down for travel or life insurance. Political involvement, whether they're a member of any campaigning groups and whether they intend to vote in the next election. And consumption, do you have a bank or building site account, do you own a computer? 
We, um, in this mixed methods study, we also have a qualitative um, data collection. We interview the service users who've been in the main study, a subsample of about 15, exploring their experiences of exclusion, what's helped them, what hasn't helped, and their views on potential interventions. We are also interviewing some of the siblings who we've interviewed about possible interventions to promote social inclusion. And we're running staff focus groups for two in each trust about discussion of possible interventions to increase social inclusion and get their views on the usefulness and applicability of the measure. We've involved the patient and public um, at stages through relevant local service user research groups which has been very helpful. They helped with the plain English summary. So, pro so from the uh, protocol application onwards, and they've helped us with the topic guides, discussion of solutions to any recruitment difficulties. And they'll be having us reviewing the results of the study and attending our final stakeholder workshop, which will be a one-day workshop, which we'll hold probably in about September, October time, to reflect a range of stakeholder groups where we'll disseminate the study findings, interpret the results and implications from the study for policy and practice. And we want to get people's views on disseminating information about the use of the SYNC and further training. And we'll present the SYNC website, which is currently under construction. This is the research group I work with. Thank you very much for listening and welcome questions. <laughs>
social engagement. Thank you so much. Not at all. Um, social integration. So the social integration debate, yeah. it kind of seemed to have items in it, some of which are about a count of the number of social interventions. And mm -hmm. then there's the, the, the old favorite from George Brown and others about whether you can trust, confide in somebody. Are they going to be additive? And mm -hmm. if they are additive, are you not adding apples and pears? Ooh, there's a question and a half. You don't have three yes. days to answer it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's really useful to hear that because I think it, it is a measure kind of in its formula, kind of formulating stage, but it's useful to hear that and I'll feed that it's back. It's the sentient and the numeric, and I'm not sure you can always have the sentient and the numeric. Ooh, and that's quite techy as well. It is. It's probably it something to keep your mind on for. Right? Yes, it's yeah. Important. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else got some questions on this? It's a difficult one. The measure at the moment, we ask about the time, the year prior to their first psychiatric admission, and we ask whether they voted at any time before that. But that's something anecdotally we're finding that reflects people's kind of apathy about the current political situation is not necessarily getting a social exclusion. So this is something that when we get the results and we're going to review these questions. Yeah. Thank you as well. Thank you. Thank you. focus away from um, inclusion and loneliness towards for all of the appropriate adults. Okay. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Tricia. Yes, thank you. Thank you for letting me get crash your session. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm talking about the role of the appropriate adult <coughs> in supporting vulnerable adults in custody. Um, for those of you who may or may not be familiar with the rule, um, it was introduced in the 80s as part of the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Um, and the appropriate adult is someone independent of the police who comes in to safeguard the legal rights and welfare of a vulnerable person who finds himself in custody. Um, vulnerability is defined as anyone under 17, 17 years <coughs> old, and any adult who is mentally vulnerable, um, and that will broadly mean uh, adults who have learning disabilities and or mental health issues. The appropriate adult is there to support, assist and advise the person in custody and um, ensure that the police act fairly. So this was introduced after a series of uh, quite serious unsafe convictions. Um, so to make sure that um, the detainee's rights are respected and that they're helped with communication um, and the protection of rights includes the right to be protected from unfair questioning, that they understand um, the questions, they understand the implications of their answers, um, and to sort of avoid false confession, really. Um, and as well as being present during an interview, um, the appropriate adult should also be present um, for any kind of processing, so fingerprinting, DNA uh, taking, um, strip searches. If you are a, a juvenile, um, the 98 um, Crime Disorder Act gave uh, youth offending teams a statutory duty to provide an appropriate adult. Um, however, if you are an adult in custody, although the police have uh, a legal duty to find uh, an appropriate adult for you, there isn't any agency with, with has been given the duty to uh, provide one. So it's a kind of an odd space. Um, and so research by the National Appropriate Adult Network um, has shown that because of that lack of statutory obligation across England and Wales, there's, uh, there, are, there is provision, some of it from the statutory sector, private or voluntary, um, but the coverage is very patchy. So there are whole swathes, for example, of Merseyside, Birmingham, Wales is a huge, where there just isn't any service providing appropriate adults um, for vulnerable adults. So quite often the police are relying on friends or family, or they'll, you know, they'll quite often they'll drag someone in off the street, give them a quick rundown of what their role is, and stick them in the interview room with a vulnerable adult. They're, they don't have any access to a dedicated service. 
Um, and so it's likely that uh, that's one of the main reasons that when we look at um, uh, inspection reports um, of custody records, quite often, too often, vulnerable adults don't have an appropriate adult there to support them. So what we know about the prison population, the proportion who have mental health or allowing disabilities, um, a lot more of them should have had an appropriate adult whilst in custody, but simply not there. We also know, um, well that main point I just said, so too few of them are provided with appropriate adults. That might be um, because there isn't one for them. It could be that custody officers um, are not very good at um, detecting vulnerability, um, or they might not want to because they know that that slows everything down. Um, and they might not find one even if they, they might not find an appropriate adult even if they were looking for one. And even if one is found and sits in with the detainee, and there have been a lot of questions raised about the effectiveness of that. So they don't always understand the role. Um, so are they there to protect welfare? Are they there to ensure due process? Is it a combination of the two? What do you do when those clash? Um, they may be uh, disempowered by the police, so it's quite an intimidating situation. And um, they might make inappropriate interventions. So there are examples from these studies um, where an appropriate adult is a friend or a parent. Um, they'll sort of encourage the detainee to tell the police what happened, you know, and that might not be the best thing to do legally. Um, just being there, however, some research has shown can make things better. So just being an independent person can sometimes make the police um, behave a little bit more fa fairly. And uh, research done uh, by Harriet Pierpoint has suggested that it, it is ill-defined, so sometimes people don't understand the rule, are they there for welfare, as I said, or legal rights. There's very little actually looking at this from the service user perspective, and that's true of criminal justice research um, uh, as a whole. So this uh, review found only four studies which looked at um, service user perspectives, service users being adults with learning difficulties. But the two studies I could find um, looking at adults with learning disabilities and that experience appropriate adults um, sort of confirmed that not all of them had, had one. Um, often where they were provided, it was a family or a friend, um, and they were conflicted about that. So although it's nice to have someone you know and that you trust, it does mean they find out things about you you might not want them to do, and, you, and the impact of that on family life might be quite difficult. Um, but they did recognise that what they wanted from an appropriate adult was someone there um, to support them with the feelings of fear, um, shame and sadness that come with finding yourself in that situation. So this study, um, it was part of a wider study funded by the SSCR, um, but we looked at four local authorities in England where there was um, adult social care involvement in, in funding a service and, and spoke to 25 professionals, so that was a combination of managers of services, people who commissioned or funded them and the police, and then those who acted as appropriate adults themselves. Um, and then we um, also spoke to service users, so we had two focus groups, one with uh, adults with learning disability, one with mental health, um, who had experience of arrest, and the idea was to compare and contrast the views of professionals with service users about what is an, uh, an effective, appropriate adult service. I'll skip that one. So, uh, starting with professionals, um, after the thematic analysis of what they said, um, the, one of the first key themes that came out of that was um, that response time and availability are key. Um, so, all those facts that are uh, in stats about there's not enough appropriate adult provision, given what we know about this population, people are very aware of that. Um, and this quote from the custody manager was saying, you know, their business is very time restrictive, so the PACE codes also say that, you know, you have 24 hours when someone is in custody or, or you have to um, either charge or bail them. So that might sound like a long time, but if it takes a long time to get an appropriate adult, we can't do anything. And so the, the key performance measure for the police and also quite often for people who are managing these services is having someone and getting them there quickly. And that's almost all that's monitored um, about the service as well. Uh, those responsible for managing the service also had um, a, a view about that the, that the role was to ensure a due process and so this is an appropriate adult manager saying you know the codes are clear about why we're there to avoid false confession, self-incrimination, that sort of thing. The third thing that they talked about um, in terms of effectiveness of an appropriate adult service was about protecting welfare and that was much more likely to come from those who acted as appropriate adults. So quite often they said the first thing they did was make sure that someone had eaten, they, they were drinking enough, if they needed medication that they had taken it. And that's not that they were being denied this or that the police weren't um, providing it, but rather that someone needed help and encouragement um, to, to, to make sure they were looking after themselves and that was a key part of their role. And finally they said they also recognised that they had a kind of an emotional supportive role and that they were very concerned to say to the vulnerable adults, you know, I, I'm just here for you, I'm independent, I'm not part of the police, just I'm, I'm here for you. And that the importance of that 
to support those adults who were feeling quite intimidated and vulnerable at the time was really key. I, another objective of the study was actually to work out, given that there's no obligation to fund a service, why did local authorities do it? Um, and so that's just some of the reasons that uh, commissioners and funders gave it. So they did recognise it, as, where they did fund it was because they recognised it was part of their wider safeguarding responsibility. Um, but they didn't monitor whether or not it actually had any safeguarding implications or if there were any benefits to them of providing appropriate adults. So they recognised that if, if they didn't fund a service, quite often uh, it would be a demand on their own social workers and mental health workers, so that was one reason for funding it. Um, and it was also to keep the police happy, so they quite often get a lot of demands from the police. And uh, um, so that there were other, other issues around that as well. So it, but it was about them taking responsibility as a local authority. But again, all they monitored when they did fund a service was the demand for it and also how often someone got there quickly. So speaking to service users, the themes that came out of there was that they confirmed that quite often they hadn't had an appropriate adult. Um, so remember there were 13 of them and some of them had been arrested multiple times and quite often they couldn't recall if they'd had one or not, so it hadn't had a huge impact on them. Um, but six could confirm that at least on one arrest they'd had an appropriate adult. And for those who had had one, they said quite often uh, it depended on whether or not they had a sympathetic custody officer, so whether uh, someone that recognised they were vulnerable and was, was willing to spend the time getting an appropriate adult for them. And the others in the group said, actually it's down to me to self-declare um, that I have a learning disability or I have mental health needs, so it's not up to the custody officer to recognise it, I have to tell them. We did have one participant who was offered an appropriate adult but refused it um, and felt that it was quite a stigmatising thing to, to be offered, really, so didn't take it up on that basis. We then asked about, uh, or they brought it up actually, whether or not um, it was better to have a member of their family um, or a professional. And, and the little bits of literature there is around uh, appropriate adult provision from the service user perspective talks about this a lot. And there was no consensus <coughs> in, in either group about which was better. Um, and so there was issues about confidentiality and, um, and the impact on family life of people in their family discovering that they'd been arrested or they'd, or they'd been in police custody were, were difficult, but at the same time they did want someone who trusted them um, and they could trust and understood um, the nature of their disability or mental health issues and how they could best communicate. Um, and those who had had a professional to support them, um, generally that had been, I think you, a, a social worker, um, they actually find that more disempowering. Um, so, uh, you know, this idea that uh, the professional would be there to support them, they, they did not experience that at all. Um, and in fact, I've got a quote about that. Uh, so the first person here is talking about his mum. Um, and actually, in this case, his mum was a mental health nurse. Um, uh, and so she was brought in to support him after an episode. He'd, he'd been uh, uh, disorderly in the street, I think it was. And, and he was actually really quite embarrassed about that and, and uh, quite ashamed that he'd mom, put his mum in that position. Um, she wasn't able to help because she didn't have the tools and the experience to do it. So he would have much preferred to have a professional there. And then the second quote is someone saying, well, actually the professional can devalu devalue me just as much as the police can. So they're just saying what I'm saying, um, but the police will listen to someone because they've got a title, so I'm really not being heard. They talked about what support they wanted for an appropriate adult, um, and the main things were help to understand what's happening to them and help to communicate back to the police. And once those two things were um, in place, they were quite happy that they could deal with the rest of it themselves. Um, emotional support was important, so there was a lot of talk about intimidation and fear and how the fact that it's a dehumanising situation. Um, so they wanted someone to help them feel protected, um, and protected from mockery was a, a, a quite a big thing that it came up. What was interesting to me was quite often what uh, people in the focus groups identified as making them vulnerable was not the fact that they had a mental health issue or that they had a learning disability. It was, it was quite often something else. So there, was, there was, were people who were saying, you know, one woman said she was arrested, there was lots of big burly policemen. She ended up in a, in a custody suite, lots of big burly policemen. And it was only when a woman, it was a woman police officer that came in and sat by her cell that so she started to feel a bit more relaxed and comfortable. And again, um, we had uh, people you know, that said to us, I'm a black man in a police station, that by definition makes me vulnerable, regardless of not whether or not I have a mental health problem. So what they saw as their vulnerability factors and not necessarily what I had saw in the scene to invite them to the focus group. Um, and they also talked about the need for post-custody support. So quite often, um, you know, the, the reasons, the complexity of their lives that have landed them 
um, in, in the police station in the first place, uh, the, film, the appropriate adult wasn't really able to help them. You know, you say goodbye to these people after they're finished custody as an appropriate adult and you're not really there to provide ongoing support. And finally, they talked about the attributes of the appropriate adult, what they wanted from someone. So the mental health group talked a lot about you know, someone who could calm a situation down, both themselves and the police, and just keep everything, um, uh, just reduce the level of noise and disorder. And learning disability were much more about communication, but there were overlaps there. So things like um, honesty, someone who was kind and confident and was knowledgeable about, about, their, uh, about their issues. So there is some overlap between the, the views of service users and professionals, um, but not a lot. And so what I began to conclude was that this, this idea of demand, uh, demand for appropriate adults and getting someone there quickly, I mean, that's often the only thing that's monitored and the only thing that is a kind of performance measure of a service. And um, whether or not it does protect someone's legal rights or whether it's uh, supportive of welfare is not something that is, is monitored or given much regard to, or there wasn't much evidence of that in the interviews, possibly because people don't know how to do it, I think. So how can you tell if an appropriate adult in, the, in having an appropriate adult actually makes the interview fader? Um, it's very difficult for the commissioners to, have a, to be wise to. Um, I think there is a... The, the, the difference, though, is that for service users who were much more about what that person is like, the demeanour, um, was, was not talked about at all. And so I, I, one of the reasons for that is that in the services that I looked at, and also there was a wider um, number of local authorities who responded to the survey, um, service user involvement is just it's not in place with the appropriate adult scheme. So some of them will have uh, user feedback forms, but there's nothing beyond that. Um, and I think that might account for some of the gaps between what is offered and what is monitored and actually what service users say that they want. So I'm um, sort of beginning to think about how um, we can do a bit more about that. And the National Appropriate Adult Network, who I mentioned um, earlier, have actually been alongside me with this study and have, have taken that on board and um, that's going to be one of their key themes um, as they're supporting appropriate adult services over the next year or so. Thank you. Thank you. The idea of it, somebody just being pulled off the street to be an appropriate adult is the one that's going to stay in my mind. Um, okay, any questions? Okay, so I'm going to ask one. Okay. If I get pulled off the street to ask to be an appropriate adult, yes. I think it's fascinating. Does it ha a, does it happen very often? And B, would you get any information, debriefing about what your role would be. There is a paragraph that is read, um, and I, I, I am an appropriate adult, so I should remember it, but it, it, it tells you that you're there to protect the legal and welfare rights, but it doesn't really tell you how. It tells you that you're not there just to observe that you can intervene, and that's pretty much it. So you, you wouldn't, you, I, I, I think it's unlikely you'd be able to perform the role well. I don't think it happens often that they literally will go out and pull one in off the street. I think what's more likely to happen is they'll get a family or a friend, as I mentioned, um, or you know they'll be phoning up uh, the GT support team, demanding <coughs> that someone comes down. But that can take hours, you know, because uh, the support teams were telling us that if someone is in custody, then they're safe. We don't treat that as someone, you know, who we need to respond to immediately. Despite what the service user might feel. Yeah. Wow. Really interesting study. Okay. Anybody else? Two questions here. The lady here and then the gentleman there. Um, I just want to know if you were pulled off the street um, and you said no, because I'm not well enough in form of etc. Is there a legal penalty? So technically the interview should not go ahead. So the the, the stick is that if, if a case gets to court and the magistrate or the judge were to say actually this person should have had an appropriate adult, it should be thrown out, but that very, very rarely happens. So the judges and magistrates tend not to wield that stick. But the, the, the penalty for the police is there. They're not actually meant to proceed. Um, so I think and there's, no, there's no actual evidence of this, but what everyone thinks is happening is that that was, makes the police less likely um, to identify vulnerability if they realise that actually it's going to take hours to get an appropriate adult. And there's no consequence for the person on the street? Oh, no, 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 you, you yes, can't literally be, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. And the gentleman here. <coughs> uh, 
a suggestion rather than a question. The, um, in Greater Manchester, the Police and Crime Commissioner uh, commissions a service for adults, and uh, the 10 local authorities have worked together to create a single um, service for children and young people, and the two are now, um, if they're not combined, I think they combined on the first April this year. But, yeah. but there's a Police and Crime Commissioner who, uh, for every area in the country, and my suggestion would be that you send your research findings to them all that don't have a service and say there, there is yeah yeah this is also going to your local press there is a bit <laughs> there is a bit of a, there is a bit of pulling and throwing about that the national appropriate adult network are aware of that um, and that model has been presented to the home office i think um i mean they're the only people with money so uh, that's why I think that's happening in Manchester and possibly uh, it's happened a little bit in even Somerset as well. But it is, ultimately it's meant to be someone completely independent of the police, which I think is why they're not, not pushing for it to go that yeah, way. Yeah, but, but the commissioning independence is, um, there's a certain secularity there, but, yeah. but, but actually um, it, the organisations that use volunteers do tend to yeah. exercise their role fairly independently. So, uh, yeah, no, just, uh, yeah, no, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Isabel. Uh, sorry, thank you, Tricia. Who am I getting to mention? That's what's going to go. Um, for those of you who were expecting to hear Frank Eaton, you'll have heard that he was going to come. But Stephen Joseph, his colleague, has offered to come and just give us a brief rundown on his study next. Um, it will be brief. And you said we could run 10 minutes late for lunch. Um, but Stephen, going to just talk to us for two or three minutes. Sorry, I've got the scary lady in the red t-shirt is on there for you. Just to tell you a little bit about the study. And then we'll open up generally for some more questions. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Hi. Um, hello, everybody. Um, just to apologise on behalf of Frank. He left a voicemail for me. It's starting this morning. This morning, and I didn't even get the message until I got here. Anyway, um, just just within the two minutes, just to uh, brief you. Just you, you got the slides anyway. Slides very brief as well. Um, basically, it is about the the aim is to look at it is it is um, called socially oriented approach to recovery for Black Black African African Caribbean men. Um, because of the disparity, we're talking about social inclusion, you know, and it's just to identify what really, you know, what are enablers for for social recovery, basically. And so what I need to just explain the aims of it, which is to identify what supports recovery for African Caribbean men, um, and also how services across the sectors um, are developed to support them better. Okay, what, in terms of methodology, um, what we're doing is um, across two sites, we've got Leeds and London. 60% uh, Le um, London and 40% um, Leeds. And what we're doing is we, we are um, interviewing service users who are, you know, they're no longer on, on admission. And then we are also now ask them to suggest to us who have been supporting them in their recovery. So it's either their family members or friends. Okay, so we call them supporters. And then we also ask them to, to suggest service providers who have been supporting them in recovery. So like that we could interview them. So the service provider could be a CPA or a social worker or, you know, or maybe a GP, whatever. So, so, it's, so what we're doing is we're doing a three-prong approach to it, basically. And um, so far, what we've, we've done so far um, is we've conducted um, in London, because I, I handled the London side, um, 36 interviews was our target, a total of 60 interviews altogether. So 36 interviews in London, 24 in Leeds, uh, so far, I have conducted 29 in London, and then at least I've conducted about 15 as well. Um, that's where we're at at the moment. Um, in terms of where the challenges we face so far, um, lies in the fact that 
many of the service users so far have not been able to really suggest a lot of providers, especially providers from the statutory sector. So the main findings is, you know, um, links to the fact that most of the service providers that they have been suggesting, you know, that they have been you know, supporting them in their recovery have been service provider from the voluntary sector. Thank you. that you get these sudden insights into bits of services that we, the funded research discovers, and it just makes you go, <laughs> that's a new one on me. Okay, what needs to be done about that? And I think that's very, very telling about the sort of research that the SSCR funds, and, and there's probably been at least one occasion in a, all of these presentations where I've gone, <laughs> well, Okay, so um, we've got about another 10 minutes for discussion and we've given us a 10 minute buy into lunch time because we were late finishing our first session. So any additional questions people want to ask, any additional topics people want to raise, any additional questions to our speakers? That would be the most important thing because that's why they're here and that's why we're here. Um, the first, first presentation was really, really interesting. Um, and you said that obviously you work with people that have existed mental health problems and the loneliness they're feeling. Longer term, do you want to go back the other way and look at how addressing loneliness first can have an impact on reducing potential future mental health problems? Yeah, so I think we, we know that that's right, that loneliness is predicted for the onset of mental health problems as well as for a group of people with it. So there's a, a case for kind of preventive interventions, aren't there? And they're supposed to do that would happen at a kind of primary care or voluntary sector level you know, rather than kind of statutory mental health services and I think sort of suddenly some social prescribing services can be accessed by people who don't have to sort of hit a depression threshold before you're allowed to, to access the service and I guess that would be working on I think there's a role for it for sure but yeah, it's a public health. Okay. David, up to the back. Yeah, um, what sort of the um, navigators um, project? Do you think there's a, a, a maximum number of people that can be supported by any one navigator? Because I think you had three navigators. And it, it, what, what do you think the capacity is of a navigator? In terms of how many navigators do you, do you have to if you're staying at the service? How many do you need to find? Okay. So are you thinking that it becomes a sort of less personalised service when it's got a huge caseload and that and you recreate the difficulties there? <coughs> yeah, I think um, that's a really good question actually, isn't it? So we will have been working with a maximum of 10, but I think we'll have a sort of staggered start if we recruit so that probably won't have as many as that on their books at the same time. Um, I think it's one of the things we can learn actually, isn't it? And it would be a really good thing to ask people about when do you reach a kind of of overload. I think in terms of sort of um, understanding your community, I mean our navigators have had to work hard to get to, the, we try to recruit people who know Barnet and Camden and Islington quite a bit anyway, but I guess you develop that expertise which cut out a little bit of the legwork for each person. Okay, thank you. Um, Jeff, yeah, um, sorry. I just prompted a thought about the navigator study. So, um, one of the services that we provide we are called our Live at Home services, and they're like community networking services for older people who are living in their own home but kind of want to tap in back to a network perhaps where they've been feeling lonely and isolated, and this is kind of supposed to be fun stuff to do and fun people to do it with, really. And your point about the navigators being quite distinct from a befriending service, I totally get that. Do you think there is something about how to help the navigators help individuals link into those befriending services as a um, as a kind of potentially as a priority area if that's something that would benefit them? Because it's quite I think about the older people angle. There are quite a lot of different organisations that provide that befriending service. I think the name itself probably puts you off because you don't know, by saying I want to go to a befriending service, you have to look at your friends. 
So, you know, there's a problem with the label. But there's something about how that expert network that's already there, potentially, where our services are, for example, or contact the elderly or the RBS or whatever, there's a network already but where your navigators might link in in terms of that kind of super speedy access system. Is that, is that something you kind of, because you've got, I know it's a small scale, so but yeah. is there something in there? So, so is it not drawing a sort of distinction between you can only lead people into kind of completely non-helping organisations in the community, I mean, where there are things like recovery services or recovery colleges that are helpful ongoing needs. But I, I think the point, perhaps one of the points you're making is quite half of them to take that first step, isn't it, really? Yes. And so to actually get to the place, you've got to have a certain level of kind of confidence and feeling okay about things, isn't it? And that's, I think, one thing where the navigators can really help, so that hopefully you leave people more tied into stuff than, than they found them. I can I pick up on two people who wanted to ask questions earlier? The lady next to you who wanted to ask something in an earlier presentation. Yeah, sorry, it's just uh, the method methodology question to the centre one. Sorry, again, because you on the spot line. Um, I'm very interested in uh, what you mentioned about you apply the NRC <coughs> guidance for uh, developing a complex intervention. So can you elaborate a bit more about how you apply the method into your study? And do you have the control group as well as uh, uh, the run the trial group? Do you, do you have a control group in your study? Cultural group. Cultural group. Cultural group. Cultural group so we, we do have a control group, um, but really we're at the stage of a feasibility trial. So I think that kind of guidelines for complex interventions is just don't launch into a big trial until you're really clear what the intervention is you're doing and how to sort of provide it in a consistent way and until you know that a trial is possible, really. So I think there are some really fundamental questions about, do we think this is acceptable? Do people seem to like this thing? Can we get our navigators sort of working in a consistent way? And can we recruit people to a trial? I think one of the things about a control group is actually, do you lose everyone in the control group? Because <coughs> they're disappointed not to get the interventions so that we can, we, we would be able to test that out in this sort of way. Sure. Thank you. Um, Gentleman in the back row. Sorry, it was addressed by an earlier question. Oh, that's okay. You're all right. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Hey, lunch isn't going to be that good. Remember the comments earlier on. We're not flashy. <laughs> and apologies, but it is for the community navigator um, presentation. Um, I just wondered. Um, obviously, you were quoting oh. participants who have a mental health problem or anxiety, um, and to what extent were you able to discover whether any of that anxiety was a social anxiety, and whether that had any impact on the group-based intervention, which I know you said was problematic. Yeah, I think um, so. We were thinking about um, measures, and initially we had social anxiety as, as a measure we were having to think in the larger scale. It'd be really nice to see, you know. You know how big a problem that is, and also whether you make any difference to it by helping people to assist it. We focus more actually on the social movement about are we having an impact on social networks and social capital and as well as loneliness. Um, but I think you're, you're right. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to talk a bit there now. Um, um, so, you know, I think, I think one thing is about recruiting people that, that there will be a sort of number of people who just think, well, that's too too scary, not for me, thank you very much. And then we need to find out how many that is naturally and why we should all that this is. Um, but yeah, I think um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> was there any impact on the, on the group from social? Sorry, the group is yeah. Of yeah, I think that's that's um, I think that's right. I think there are two things with the group. One is that thing is it's quite scary and actually part of the skill of the navigator is to find a group that really hits people with both their interests and people's sense of self is accessible and feels okay to go to and that's any single group is not going to do that. And I think the other thing is just to think about interest is really that, you know, people are more likely to take the plunge and make this difficult thing for something that really fits with their personal identity rather than a kind of here's a group which might be used to do, which is kind of possibly a better part to see. Yeah, so the individual approach is more personalised. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what the Groups for Health program really talks a lot about is the social identity and you know, sort of that fits with your values and your sense of self, then it's, it's sort of, you can get more from it and hopefully not just deal with your social isolation, but connect with people in it as well. 
Okay, I'm going to take Chair's right in it and make a link that I think probably works okay, but I'm going to ask Rachel to make sure. Rachel, your social network schedule and um, sync, there seems to be some overlap there, am I right? Yeah, I think there might be, and also with the um, social mapping as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of uh, social inclusion, um, uh, many writers, including myself, would say that belonging to a social network is the apex of social inclusion because you have to have relationships in order to get those other things. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Social Network Guide aims to map uh, an individual social network uh, in terms of their, the individuals who report to them but also the other people that are involved in them because but obviously there's both the informal and formal social support and it's about you know, you, you might have a social network, but if it provides you a diddly squat, there's not much point to it. And a, a lot of the, the, the um, issues around companionship uh, relate specifically to loneliness as well. So um, it's, there are a lot of things, I think, in relation to that, both in learning disability and mental health. Okay. Okay, so I'm kind of making that link in my brain now. Yes. Well, yes. I'll just look forward to seeing you have all together, I think, over lunch. Yeah, because <laughs> I was interested in what social network outcome measure you were using. Sorry? Loving the social network measure. It's a really small measure that talks about number of friends and number of family. Yeah, I just think the social network is much wider than that and that people um, give you different things in your life. So you need to be mapping the whole of the social network, not just um, discrete. So looking at the social capital and using Martin Weber's resources yeah. generating. Yeah. Well, we can try to lunch because I like lunch. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't kind of say it. <laughs> I'll get them over lunch. Okay, one more question. I'll pick up on Stephen's hand. We haven't given him much time. And then I'll let you all just do it. Please, Kate. Stephen. This is for church. Do you know the, the appropriate adult? I was just wondering if. Uh, to what extent is this? Because it's the first time I'm hearing about it. I don't know to what extent people really know about it. So is it is it part of is it a government policy? Is it is it covered? What legislation covers it? And and to what extent are people really you know like when young people get arrested? Sorry, what's the second bit? When young people get arrested, people get arrested. Do they do they get told that you know you are entitled to? They don't just be given one by default. So um, they have to have an appropriate adult there if you're 17 or under, and the youth entity team will they provide one, or they'll have commissioned a uh, service to someone as there for them. So the, the, the policy is the Police and Criminal Evidence Act. It's been in place since the 80s, but the, the problem is that there isn't, you know, for adults, there isn't anyone with a duty to provide. And I think the reasons you haven't heard about it is because the reasons we do here don't hear a lot about adults with mental health and learning disabilities. They're Quite often not hired. So, yeah. so, so what was the act of you? What was the legislation? Police and Criminal Evidence Act. Thank you. Okay. Hey. Having, <coughs> having been clearly prompted by Rachel, thank you, Rachel. <laughs> 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 Shall we finish the session? Thank you.